Welcome to Strategy Talk where the authors and editors discuss news and events with a splash of history. Our host today is Dan Masterson. Joining him is Jim Dunnigan, well-known military author and the Dean of Wargaming. Also, joining today's show is columnist and author retired Colonel Austin Bay. Welcome Austin and Jim. End of the year, time to uh, talk about what's been going on during the year and sort of wrap things up uh, before we start the new year. Jim, what was the obvious, I guess the obvious top story is the Hamas attack. Is that right? Well, yes and no. Uh, it was a, it was a, it was spectacular, uh, especially from the uh, viewpoint of the Palestinians. But its long-term impact, eh, you know, the Hamas has been uh, losing the forces it, it mustered, as it were, uh, in uh, Gaza. And uh, now they're slowly, slowly being eliminated. They've got no place to go. Some of them made it to the uh, West Bank, where the Israelis are, you know, tracking them down and killing them. Nobody surrenders. Uh, Israel is doing the same thing in, uh, in Gaza which is a little more difficult because the uh, Hamas has a lot of civilians to hide behind, which they do energetically and unapologetically. They call the dead civilians involuntary martyrs to the cause. That's a, that's been a favorite phrase with Islamic terrorists, you know, for uh, over a decade. Uh, <clears throat> and I think something like 20,000 Palestinians have died so far in, uh, in Gaza because of the... Uh, uh, the, the fight against uh, Hamas. Uh, Hamas has taken losses. They've lost some uh, senior leaders. Uh, I think Israel is starting to flood the tunnels. Uh, they want to get their hostages out, but you know they're they they're, they're getting no proof of life, as it were, from Hamas. So for all they know, the hostages are already gone. Uh, it's 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 a, it's a sad choice. They either have to choose: do we wait? Do we wait? Do we wait? And let Hamas, you know, get away, or you know, prepare for another attack. Or do we go after them? Uh, it's good. And um, but in, in, in the grand scope of things, that's not much. The big deal was in Ukraine. Uh, that is a near peer war. Uh, you know, two relatively equal uh, forces going after one another. Now, NATO is supplying the Ukrainians. But the Ukrainians are doing the fighting. <laughs> the Ukrainians, they prefer to have manpower from, you know, NATO, but they'll take all the weapons they can get. Um, and uh, they've been doing, you know, quite well with them. They're they're basically waging a counteroffensive. Although I NATO and especially the United States have uh, uh, dialed down on the equipment they're sending them. You know, uh, if if NATO is if the United States is is uh, is uh, noted for anything, it's bad timing. Um, but what are you going to do? You know, democracy, as Churchill pointed out, is the worst form of government, except for all the others. And we're seeing that in action because the Russians are having a big bigger problems in that the uh, their economy is starting to uh, weaken dramatically, and the uh, uh, Putin, the latter day Stalin. Is saying tough it up, you know. He basically believes, with some justification, that uh, Russians do best when they're under the most duress. But the problem here is, Russia is not being attacked. Russia is the attacker, and that is becoming a little more embarrassing. In fact, there was a um, at the end of the year, Putin is in the custom of having a, uh, a, a how should I put it, an you know, open house, you know, uh, on on the net, visually. Uh, you know, when uh, he basically allows people to pop in on, on the periphery around him with questions which aren't screened. A uh, big mistake. Uh, and, and most of them were critical of the way Putin was handling things, especially the war in Ukraine. Because again, as a lot of Russians have pointed out, in, the, in Ukraine, the Russians are the Nazis. I mean, they're the ones invading. You know, everybody talks about World War II and the, the Germans, the Nazis invading Russia. Well, now it's Russia invading Ukraine uh, under the auspices of uh, regaining, uh, putting Ukraine back into Russia, which the Ukrainians are resisting, and they're fighting the Russian Nazis. So, you know, it goes round and round. 
and eventually the chickens come home to roost, which is happening with Russia. Putin, I don't know what he's going to do. He's not making much progress economically or militarily. And uh, propaganda-wise, he took a real beating in this latest, you know, town hall, as it were. Uh, well, when Russians were given a chance to come right out and say what they thought, they didn't think what he wanted them to think. Uh, so, you know, that's not going to end well. Uh, I think the Ukrainians will eventually prevail uh, despite the, how should I put it, the weak-hearted, you know, the the uh, weak-hearted uh, support of NATO, which is now, you know, they're bickering among themselves. The Germans, I'll give them credit. The Germans pointed out publicly uh, in their parliament that they are next in line. I mean, the Poles are there. The Poles agree. Uh, the Poles and the Germans, believe it or not, are uh, talking about some kind of military alliance where you'd have German troops stationed in Poland, whoever, whoever thought, think that would happen. Um, and uh, just to discourage the Russians, the Baltic states the same way. Uh, in fact, they're all already rounding up their Russian-speaking minorities and double-checking for their loyalty. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how well that's going to work out, but the Baltic states, especially I think it's Estonia, has a problem where they have a major uh, minority. I think it's about 20%. Of the population is Russian, and as far as I know, those Russians have proven very loyal in the past. They do not want to be ruled by Russians. Uh, they see what's happening. A lot of them have, you know, family on the other side in Russia, and they communicate by the internet and they have what have you or visit, and they realize that it's much better in the Baltic states uh, under Western rules than it is in Russia under Vladimir Putin's rules. So. It's a same old story. We've got ourselves a mess. It's difficult to get out of, uh, but I think eventually they will. I mean, with, uh, Putin basically has said that he can keep this war going on indefinitely. He'll just keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting until the West tires of supporting uh, Ukraine and allows it to be swallowed up by Russia. I, I kind of doubt that that's going to happen because when things get that desperate, that's when uh, NATO gets, re gets reasonable and says, hey, we, we better do something. Gee, why didn't we think of this before? <clears throat> and it goes back and forth. Uh, Ukraine wants to win their territory back. About 17% of their territory is still occupied by Russia. Uh, and that's the thing that's going to take the most effort. Uh, Russia has declared most of those occupied territories as an integral part of, of Russia. In fact, in the last census, I think it was 2020, <laughs> the population actually went up a bit, mainly because it incorporated the Crimea and several other areas, uh, especially as part of Russia. So uh, it's going to take a while. Russia says they're not going to stop, but, you know, uh, they're eventually going to literally run out of gas because they haven't got an unlimited supply of uh, economic uh, necessities for the population uh, or weapons. Uh, Russians are already putting most of their their uh, economic capabilities into producing more weapons. Uh, but like I say, you know, the Russians ultimately have a vote, and they're also they're eventually going to vote. Hey, we're not going to starve to support Putin's war on Ukraine. My analysis. That's it. So, Austin, do you have a different view? <clears throat> Well, I actually agree with uh, with Jim on why Ukraine is a bigger quote unquote story than uh, October seventh Hamas and Israel's uh, Israel's response, a multivalent response. But uh, let, let let me talk about Ukraine just for a second. I think the big story behind Ukraine, and uh, Jim touches on it. Uh, the domestic politics of Russia is the horrendous casualties that the Russians have taken. Now, you've seen in uh, what I'll call dominant media, media instead of major media, dominant media, is that, oh, Ukraine's counteroffensive failed. Well, it didn't achieve a breakthrough that uh, Ukrainians hoped for. Uh, NATO hoped for, uh, Ukraine's uh, allies and, and supporters thought they might get. But one of the key components in mechanized war and 
successful breakthrough on that is having uh, air power. And we, we see the limits of, of, of missile and, and drone uh, c- capabilities, at least current ones, and uh, they, they don't have the same punch as close air support from F-16s. And, the, and uh, the Biden administration was slow and very slow, a year slow in providing uh, training and uh, aircraft F-16s, even though that now they, uh, they're training going on in, uh, was it, Romania, Jim? Romania, yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's a, really a NATO-wide effort because they're getting <laughs> F-16s cascaded from several NATO nations' uh, inv- inventories. Uh, so t- tied into the this of, you know, the so-called stalemate, <clears throat> it's not a stalemate when you're killing as many uh, of the enemy as the Ukrainians are. Now, they're taking casualties, and they're smaller, but they're still with maybe a small minority. Uh, they're still a nation in arms, and Russia, Jim was talking about that uh, flop of of Vlad's uh, o- online uh, uh, chit chat. There are four or five other quote unquote national events where demonstrations have popped up, anger expressed. I mean, you know, and this this is in a police state. One of them, including a, a absolute rupture uh, of the. Uh, uh, torrent, I suppose, would be, be- uh, better, of scorn for some of these uh, end-of-the-year parties in uh, ups- upscale oligarch Moscow. Now, they sound small, but they're, they're, they're so wealthy, they're making the classic mistakes of the, uh, of the ultra-rich showing off, and because of the porosity of information, enough people know about it, like Tens of millions of Russians know about it, and they resent it. And they're at being asked, as Jim said, by by Putin, to you know we're under duress. We've got to we got to fight, and then hold it. We're not defending Mother Russia. Oh, you know, Jim covered uh, covered that. And it's this is a this a war in Europe between two near peers is a huge, big, dominating story. Well, let's go back now to. Israel Hamas war. Now the, the shock of that attack was extraordinary. You expect the Israeli security to be absolutely one of the best uh, on the planet, and uh, it usually is. But you let your guard down, and look what Hamas is. So here's this is a big story if it were properly presented, and you had a, a honest major media. I'll say say it say it there is. <clears throat> Hamas reveals itself to be, uh, you know, they, they don't want peace. They don't want a two-state solution. They want genocide of Israelis is what they want. You know, between the river and the sea, that's uh, that's what they want. That's gone. Their, you know, uh, appeal is if they're the oppressed and uh, Israel the oppressor. Uh, it's only, it's, it's not gone in the, among the propagandists and the multiculturalists in the United States and Europe that believe that uh, you know, uh, believe that crap. You've also seen Iran, and I think it was always implied, but they've triggered it, all, use of their proxies for multiple front warfare. Uh, Hezbollah and also shooting in Iraq, you know, threats towards Bahrain, that doesn't get much coverage, but I've been uh, been lo- uh, look looking at it, you know, stirring trouble in Bahrain because it's got a large, uh, uh, I think predominantly uh, Shia m- uh, Muslim uh, ruled by uh, 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 Sunni elites, and the Houthis with uh, they're fighting their their uh, war in the Red Sea, Bab al Mandab, you know, the 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 uh, choke points of Straits of Hormuz, which is right. By Iran, it's a, a Persian Gulf going into the Arabian Sea, and then and the, and the, and the Houthis are Shia rebels in Yemen. Yeah, oh, they are. They're, they are. They're Shia. They're they're, 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 they're another Shia. Well, and Hezbollah, Hezbollah is, is pretty, uh, overwhelmingly uh, Shia. That's part of the Iran's Shia crescent uh, 
strategy that they, they talk about. Well, you've seen it revealed. And what is jaw-dropping is the U.S. forces reluctance or orders not to shoot back, you know, taking, uh, so far, taking no, well, concussion casualties is what we've, uh, what we've heard, and shooting down in the Red Sea, Houthi drones and missiles, you know, the, their 30, 20, $50,000 missiles being shot down by $2 million U.S. missiles. Uh, but they're uh, taking them down. But the thing is, those they ought to be offensive and going after the uh, Iranian, excuse me, the Houthi shooters. Uh, I said it right, actually. Iranian, because uh, they're Al Quds Force, uh, Iranian Special Forces officers overseeing the uh, Houthi uh, missile off uh, offensive. So, uh, you know, Iran's pulled the trigger. What have they gotten for? Well, they've revealed it. Also, to, we've, we, NATO, because the French are operating uh, down there as well as in the uh, uh, British, and the Israelis got a lot of intelligence out of this. The one thing we should have done and should be doing now is definitely be knocking out those Houthi launch sites. And you have two carrier groups over there in the uh, Middle East to do it, but you also have U.S. assets in other places and other NATO assets to go after uh, go after the Houthis. And uh, they should be going after the uh, Iranian proxies in Syria and, uh, and Iraq. And those, I know, can be hit from uh, NATO bases. Uh, who knows what Erdogan is going to do in Turkey, but he has no truck with the uh, Iranian uh, Iranian proxies either, and uh, it's there are also NATO rights to use bases. You can deny other NATO nations the right to use a base that is a NATO base and a, on sovereign political issues, but on this one, you're looking at a a low-level shooting war where one of your key allies uh, is uh, is being targeted. We're, I'm saying U.S. U.S. being targeted. So I mean, I can see what I've described uh, very loosely here is is how you can how you carry out this kind of offensive mission that I say we we should be doing. And yeah, there'll still be some some shooters that survive it, but, but they're going to lose, especially uh, in in Yemen. Uh, they're they're going to lose all their stockpiles. That they've got, that they've the Iranians have spent so much time and effort smuggling into Yemen. Uh, and who knows whether we could use Saudi bases, but it might be able to 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 strike them. That's another uh, option. But we really don't need Saudi air bases to to take them out. So Dan, you know, you were looking at big stories of the year. One to me is. Uh, well, for, first of all, I'm, I'm primarily uh, you know, say it's a U.S. problem, but well, failure to get the get the Ukrainians uh, high performance aircraft to support their uh, ground forces. Uh, I know the Russians have great uh, anti aircraft missile uh, uh, capabilities, but what I'm looking at is using uh, the using those uh, uh, air to uh, pump up your uh, offensive operations. That's a failure, and then the failure by slash U.S. slash NATO to take out uh, Iranian proxy shooters that are shooting at U.S. forces or NATO forces. Now, th those are big stories, and I know they're being watched by, by China. I know that there's also some cases that diplomats say, but if you shoot back, we're in a shooting war, and then you flip it back on them and say, we're already in a shooting war. Now, what what are you going to do? Just expose U.S. forces to to uh, b potential casualties or taking casualties, and it would calm the Houthis down, knock out their supplies, and then suddenly marine insurance rates would go down because they're not threatening to sink commercial vessels. Uh, it's all right. That's a, that's the way I analyze it. Basically, I I, I see some. The global import in what 
the Iranians have tried to do is very real. If you look at the, uh, the spike in marine uh, insurance, maritime insurance, and the rerouting of uh, tankers and commercial vessels to go around the Cape of Good Hope instead of go through Suez. It, it hits everybody in the pocketbook. And I've written a couple of, of columns about that uh, about that recently, but it's it, it was something r- Iran always threatened to do, and they've done it. So now you see the response, and the response should be, okay, shoot back, destroy their missile launch sites, destroy their stockpiles. So that's uh, the, the part of the non-story is, is, to me, a big story. Non-response is a big story. Jim, after uh, Hamas and Ukraine, what else has been happening this year? Well, there's been a revolution in warfare that is sort of slipped under the... <laughs> The, the day's feed. Uh, the, and we have a piece, there's a piece coming up on the 26th, I believe, about FP, FPV UAVs, is a first person viewer uh, drones. And these have been used in the thousands and they have drastically changed the fighting, the way you fight in Ukraine. Both sides have them. Uh, uh, it, there's an electronic war going on between Ukraine and Russia, you know, jamming the, uh, the signals. Although you can avoid that by simply sending a drone uh, at a specific target, you know, using GPS or dead reckoning initial or inertial guidance system, which is unjammable, uh, and still hit the target. In other words, there's all sorts of innovation coming, going there, and they're using and, and thousands of of uh, these things are being destroyed each uh, month. But they keep making new ones because they're so cheap. You know, the most high tech of these uh, these uh, drones. Uh, is 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 you know about five hundred maybe a thousand dollars the ones with night vision and all sorts of electronic you know gadget gadgetry but most of them are dirt simple you know five hundred dollars specials and they go in there and they just dominate the battlefield they give you the view of whoever's doing what everywhere and on a large front I mean the 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 Ukrainian front is about a thousand kilometers long so there's you can't cover it all. But you can with your with your drones. Yeah, these UAVs basically see everything, and a, a large number of them not only see things, but they're carrying an explosive payload. You know, the the, initial, the first ones the Ukrainians started using, you know, over a year ago, simply had a, a hand grenade attached. You know, with the with the pin being held by the uh, you know a ad hoc mechanism underneath it. And all the operator had to do was when he saw a target, when he was like over a tank or a foxhole, he just hit the button and bing, the grenade armed would, would fall and uh, do a lot of destruction. And they have it on film. I mean, there's a lot of videos of this happening. Uh, not only that, but they would use these fuel air explosive grenades, thermobaric grenades, which should basically uh, create a huge uh, cloud of fire, which goes into, into, into side any uh, you know, opening. Whether it be a you know a tank a tank hatch, a foxhole, a, a bunker, what have you, it's a devastating weapon. It's been around for a long time, but it's a question of how you apply it. I mean, this massive use of UAVs has basically uh, made the battlefield you can't hide. Like I said, if you use the high end UAVs with the night vision and thermal vision, even thermal vision, which is more expensive, you basically rule the night. Wherever you suspect the enemy is operating, you go in there. For example, the Ukrainians, more so than the uh, the Russians, have been using this to attack Russian supplies. Now, they can't do it a day anymore because all these UAVs and a lot of them are wrong. They see a Russian truck or Russians are using remotely controlled vehicles because you just having a hard time getting Russians to drive the trucks because it's, it's almost suicide. Uh, uh, they're trying it at night, but now you have some of these UAVs with the night vision, and they simply uh, detect a, a vehicle going down a road, and uh, they 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 either call in other UAVs or they have the uh, the um, the new the tanks that NATO has sent to uh, uh, to Ukraine, the uh, the Leopard twos in particular, and uh, some of the retrofitted you know older tanks 
have this fantastic uh, night vision thermals, thermal uh, sights, and fire control system. And they have been devastating at night. Some of them go out at night simply looking for anything they can find. You know, they go, they don't go deep in the enemy territory, but they can fire a high explosive round, you know, a couple of thousand meters uh, and, and accurately. And, uh, and this basically forces the Russians to change the way they move. It, there's no more cover of night. Uh, in fact, with, the, <laughs> with a lot of these, uh, these new sensors, even fog or mist, they can see through. So, you know, the, you, you, there's no cover anymore. Yeah, again, if there's, if there's, now it's winter time and the leaves are all gone, but even when the leaves are there, you can see through them. Uh, and so this is revolutionized warfare. Uh, if the enemy has an edge in terms of the numbers of, um, of uh, UAVs uh, or aircraft or what have you, uh, the enemy can be found. Ambush, forget about it. Moving supplies, forget about it. I mean, uh, they'll just keep attacking them, and your guys... Now, this has been a problem with the uh, Russians from day one, because the first thing the Ukrainians got were the uh, the HIMARS, you know, vehicles with the uh, Glimmer, you know, the guided uh, rockets. And they were the first thing the, the uh, they went after were the Russian supplies, and that forced the Russians to move their supplies, you know, back almost 100 kilometers from the front to avoid that. But now we've supplied them with longer range, even longer range weapons, and it's 150 kilometers back they got to go. And, and he, with supplies that far back, they put them on a truck and take them to the front. They got to run the gauntlet of all these drones, you know, out looking for a target. Ah, oh, there's a truck. Let's bomb it. Boom. And that's it. So warfare, warfare, you know, without anybody really paying attention, it's not been a big newsworthy story. It's been revolutionized. It'll never be the same. Austin, what do you think is are the second tier stories? Well, I've got another first tier story that d- didn't get a lot of coverage, and we covered it a little bit, but that's India uh, gaining a slight edge over China. I think it was really late December 2022, but then January of, of, of 2023. Uh, getting an intelligence edge on one of China's attempts to try to nudge a road a little deeper into uh, "quote unquote" disputed territory, but but if you look at the, the, the if this were being handled in an international court, I think India would w- w- would win on uh, on where the the border is. But the uh, Indians got the jump on the Chinese, and uh, the Chinese were absolutely uh, flabbergasted. Small. Small story, but also the the repercussions are, you know, China wants to <clears throat> bully. It's not very good at doing it with India, but all of its smaller neighbors, you know, in these bilateral confrontations uh, that uh, you know, they do it to Vietnam, they do it to the to the Philippines. In some ways try to do it to Taiwan, and even try to do it to uh, to uh, Japan, but. Uh, India is a, a problem for Beijing because it is a huge land front, and the Indian Army is no pushover. It's actually had more combat experience than the People's Liberation Army, uh, and uh, it, it, it has uh, it, some of the coverage that Jim's had on India is just, if I may say so, fabulous because he gets into the how corruptions. Eaten, eaten uh, out uh, Indian Army combat power and how they, the training issues and the like, but it's still a, an, an immense and immensely powerful force. And in, in some cases, uh, a, a successfully modernized force. Not throughout, but they've got uh, uh, some interesting weapons that they're already fielding and, uh, and could be fielding uh, soon. Uh, that's, a, that's not something that breaks through. Uh, it would break through. Uh, and uh, w- with headlines, if they uh, went to war again, if the 1962 Sino-Indian War went super hot again, because it's not over. It's another one of these frozen wars. And of course, the joke about that war is it's frozen because it's up in the uh, Himalayas. But that that happened, and it had repercussions with the the Chinese and the Indians. Uh, Indians knew what they'd done. Uh, so th- that. That's, that doesn't have the 
cachet of uh, Ukraine and uh, Israel, Israel Hamas doesn't, doesn't have the attention, but uh, it definitely happened. Oh, I remember one thing I was going to say when Jim was talking about the Germans having a base in Poland. <clears throat> Uh, you know, within the last two weeks, uh, Germany and Lithuania, and Lithuania had been asking for the Germans for this, agreed to have a permanently stationed uh, a German uh, uh, army force, Bundeswehr force, uh, in, in, on Lithuanian soil. Now, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but it's a, it most likely, I mean, it's a quote-unquote defensive It'd be a mechanized infantry units uh, uh, of some type with uh, artillery and the like. But heavens, uh, German, as Jim was saying, can you believe a German force permanently stationed in Poland? Well, you're having one permanently stationed in, in, in Lithuania. And it's, it's, it's not just the Germans doing it. They're rotational U.S. forces. And there's still, the Poles are still uh, asking the U.S. to put a, a permanent armor brigade somewhere in Poland. Uh, no, they're, they're wanting us as tripwires, but uh, they're forward deployed, and you get the, the tripwire effect, but then the Russians they can't go through the Ukrainians. What are they going to do when they run into uh, U.S., French, and German forces that, with, that are with a fully modernized uh, uh, equipment? And another story, this isn't new to 2023, but it really presents the Russians with a problem. And it's given the information porosity, it has domestic repercussions within Russia. All the Finns, you know, the Grand Duchy of Finland, isn't that what the Tsar called it, Jim, or something like that? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, it's not a Grand Duchy. When it is, it's a NATO ally and it's a very heavily armed, though small, NATO nation, though. Well, I don't mean it's not small in size, but in, in terms of. Uh, a, a population, but every single one of them are fighters. I mean, they've got a good slug of women in that in their militia and reserve groups, just like the Israelis. Uh, it's a, a tough nut to crack, and it's now they they just signed uh, within the last month uh, a, a new agreement specifically with the United States on training, intelligence sharing. Uh, logistical uh, help uh, and the like, and who you want to go to war again? Uh, they, they've, the lesson I hope I'm, I'm kind of moving out of our subject on this is that the, the Russians get topple Putin and get a leader that just wants to concentrate on, on on making Russia wealthy instead of going around trying to rebuild the Tsar's empire. Uh, that too much many pieces of the empire uh, are are aware of. Uh, aware that they're far better off uh, dealing with Western Europe and having a Western European uh, governmental model. Uh, it, uh, it's it, it's the czar, the dictator model that Putin follows is a loser. Jim, do you have anything else before we wrap it up? No, that's basically it. I mean, there's been change. We've covered those, and uh, and we'll see more of those changes play out in uh, 2024, Austin, I, I, I think that's a, a, a excellent summary, and I, you know, I think you know, you know, somebody's going to say, "Why didn't you add this? Why didn't you add that?" Well, I, I think we hit the the, uh, the significant points. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll uh, talk to you, gentlemen, next year. Happy New Year, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Bye. 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 Bye.